Live from Utrecht, this is Bitcoin. Explained. Hey, Sjors. Yo. Hey, Ruben. Hey. Ruben is back. Uh, I think last time in Prague, we were all in Prague uh, True. L- last week. And there I introduced you as our resident funky second layer expert. That is right. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about one of your new proposals, which is actually not a second layer proposal. True. You've, yeah. you've uh, promoted to the base chain. I Congratulations. Guess so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the base chain. <laughs> it's uh, good to be here. Thank you. So yeah, we're going to discuss silent payments. Yep. This is a proposal you made uh, recently, right? A couple, yeah, it's, couple it's of a weeks recent ago. proposal, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you proposed this a couple of months ago, but yep. I think the general idea is also older, right? You're, you're, Very it, old. It's based on an old idea called stealth addresses, I think, originally yep. proposed by Peter Todd years ago. Yeah, 2014. Right. And this is an improvement on that, an iteration on that. How yeah. would you describe that? Yeah, you could say that. So yeah, the interesting thing is that uh, the original proposal, I, I think the idea is kind of old, but the 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 downside of of this uh, version is that you have to do a lot of work in, essentially to recognize that you got paid of your version. Yes, right. and I think in the past it's not it's not like people didn't think of that, but um, at the time it seemed like that was going to be too much work. And Bitcoin has improved a lot over the years, so actually I think sort of like that that thinking never got updated. Uh, and now we're at the, at the point where we can do uh, these uh, these kind of the, ver- the, the verification of the blockchain quite quickly, right? Uh, and the uh, the the library that we use, Libsec P twenty five twenty what two hundred fifty six K one, um, that library is very fast now. So basically, um, it, it made made it more viable than it was back back in twenty fourteen. Okay. And for the so- loyal listeners, we did an episode about Libsec P two fifty six K one. Um, I think is episode two. Really? Oh wow! That's that's short for you. You'll remember everything. <laughs> okay, uh, so let, we can maybe get into the comparisons later. Yeah. But for now, what is the general idea? What's the general problem that we're solving? Yeah. So, uh, kind of a good way of putting it is that generally speaking, when you want to make a payment. Uh, you have two options. Someone can give an address and you can reuse that address and continually pay that person on the same address. Uh, and if you do that, then you lose all all privacy mm-hmm. because every time you receive a payment, I know it's your address and then maybe, you know, sure, send some money to you and I, I, I can see how many Bitcoins you have, et cetera, right. et cetera. Um, so because that's a problem, generally what we do is, let's say, Aaron, if I want to send you a payment, I, I tell you, I say like, hey, Aaron, I want to send you some Bitcoin. Could you please give me an address? And you're sure here's, here's an address. And every time I want to pay you, you have to give me that address. Well, I'll generate a new address every yeah. time, right? That's yeah. what you generate mean. Generate a yeah. new one. Yeah. Ideally. A, a fresh one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so this proposal, uh, Silent Payments, allows you to basically have a single static address and allow me to derive an address from that that nobody can recognize except for you and me. Um, and so this makes it basically, it, it makes it the same process, but now it's non-interactive where I don't have to ask you for an address. And that is particularly useful when you think of uh, things like donations, where there's a cost, the cost posts one single address and everybody goes and donates to that cost and no interaction is required. Uh, so that is basically a deep proposal. Right. So if I want to accept donations, then I'll post this. What, no, it's a stealth address, but you're not calling it a stealth address. Yeah, you're I, calling it a silent payment address, right? Yes, just to differentiate, oh, but but it is essentially yeah. a form of same idea. Yeah. yeah. So I'm posting this quote unquote address on my website, and then you, Ruben, in this case, can generate new addresses from this. Yes. And send money there, and then somehow I should be able to spend from this address. That's kind of where the trick comes in. That is like correct. how can I spend money from addresses that you generated? Yes. Yep. Okay. Ruben, how can I spend money <laughs> from addresses that you generated? Sure. Um, yeah, so essentially what we do is uh, we generate a shared secret. And generating a shared secret is done by taking two public keys that the, uh, you have a public key, I have a public key. And because we both know one private key, you know your private key, I know my private key, we can do this calculation, which is basically a multiplication that allows us to generate a number that you know and I know, but nobody else knows. 
And with this number, we can then generate a, a key that is sort of shared between us. So it's, it's a public key. You can sit, could send money to that key, but if I were to send money to that key, both you and I could spend it, so that's not quite good enough. Uh, so we add one more step after we have this shared secret, which we turn into a shared key, we then add your public key to it. So now it's a combination of the shared key plus your key. And that combination is something that only you know, because I don't know your public key. I don't know the, the, the private key behind your public key. Okay, that, that's a lot of information at, yes. at, in one go. So let's, <laughs> so let's break it down. All right. so, so what we did was a Diffie-Hellman exchange right. plus something else. Right, exactly. So, um, sure. Yes. <laughs> what is a Diffie-Hellman exchange? Maybe we let, that's the first part we can break down here, I think. So Diffie-Hellman was a famous rapper. No. Um, <laughs> I wish. Th- basically, the idea... <clears throat> you're taking it's it's being used in browsers too for example right so so when you connect to a website uh, that's secure um they they have a public key the website essentially has a public key and you on your computer generate another public key and um, you basically uh tell the web server hey here's my public key and then the web server can send you information in secret and you can send the uh, the web server information too that's secret uh and so this takes this really uses a very nice mathematical property, which is that if you take a pr- private key A and you multiply it by a public key B, that is the same as when you take public key A times private key B. Yep, right. So that means that, so well, you... with Bitcoin, we have addresses, which is essentially just a combination of a private key and a public key. So if, if I know my private key, obviously, and you know my public key, and vice versa, then we can create a shared, essentially a shared address, a shared Bitcoin address, where we both would own the shared Bitcoin private key, and we both would own the <clears throat> Bitcoin uh, sh- shared public key. But this would be utterly useless, because if, if either of us sends money to that, then either of us can steal that money. Um, we don't want that. Yeah, okay. I'm following you. Yep. Because, but that's also because before we started recording, mm-hmm. I had an hour to try to understand this. So uh, to summarize this real briefly, the Diffie-Hellman exchange, two people have a public and a private key, and then multiplying one public key with the other private key gets a secret number, right? So And because both persons know their own private key, and the other person's public key, they can both generate this number, but no one else can generate this number because no one has either, no one else has either private key. Yeah. Okay, so from this secret number, you could potentially create a Bitcoin private key. You, you could say that's a Bitcoin private key, yeah. essentially, yeah. and then have a public key. And then basically what you were just saying, Shores, is you could use that, like, the, like if Ruben wants to send me money, he could use that, well, he couldn't, but he he could <laughs> send me money to that Bitcoin public key, and then we both have the private key. So the problem is then Ruben can just take the money back. So yeah, I, and I mean that I would have be... been paid, but I wouldn't because Ruben can claim the it, money. It back. could be or, a feature. So, or, <laughs> so we need to add one more level. Level, yeah, right? It, it's a reversible payment. Maybe exchanges would like this. Right? Well, they send money and they can take it back. Or, <laughs> just kidding. Or you make it a two-step process, right? Where you receive the money on this common address and then the other side sweeps it away. Yeah. And once the sweep is confirmed, but that would mean yeah. two transactions for one. But we really don't need to do that. Yeah. So I'm 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 not sure if I just made it more confusing for the <laughs> listener. This is the way I understood it. Yeah. So maybe that helps. So like you you could now generate a Bitcoin private key and a public key. However, if you send money to that, that's not secure because you can claim the money back. Yeah. So there's one extra step that needs to be taken here. What's that extra step, Ruben? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the extra step is that we take that shared secret, that shared key, and we add the public key of the recipient to that shared key. Right. And so this is the same public key that I was sharing publicly, the silent yes. payment thing that I had as a donation address. Yeah. And we now add the shared... Uh, am I no? You, you finish this sentence for yeah, me be, you, before you, I say it wrong. Yeah, you add the shared key to it, right? Which is a derivative of the shared secret. And in this case, when you say adding it to it, it's yeah. basic. It's kind of like creating a two out of two multi sig. Yes. Except we use cryptographic tricks. Well, it, it's not actually a two of two. It looks yeah. like a one key out of one key, but it's sort of 
it, it is kind of like a two of two, right? You could you could think of it in that way, but essentially, it it is basically we're using the fact that you can use elliptic curve curve cryptography in a way that is basically like regular math, where you can take someone's key and you can take someone else's key and you add them together, and you you if you do this with the public keys, uh, the private key is also the addition of one private key with the other private key. So we have two private keys essentially. Uh, and by adding by adding those two together, uh, we generate a key that only you know, because I, I know one of the private yes. keys if I were to send a payment to you, but I don't know the other one because it's your key. Right, so the two private keys that we're adding together to be very clear yeah. are the shared secret private key yeah. that you were able to generate in combination with my public key. Yeah. And then my actual public, uh, private key yeah. that corresponds to the public key that I posted. So that's the yeah. two that we're adding together yeah. to create a new private key and a new public key. Well, yeah. I, I'm the only one who can create the new private key because I'm the only one who has the private key that corresponds with my public. Maybe I can illustrate it from the other side, uh, which is that if you just published your stealth address and we don't use it as, or sorry, as a silent payment address, if you just publish an address, then anybody can send to it. Right, it would just be a regular transaction, but you only right. have the private key and I <clears throat> have the public key. The downside of that is that everybody can see what's going on. So, what if you just add something to this regular address? So you're adding a shared key to the regular address. Essentially, yeah. that might yeah. be, even be an easier way to understand it. Yeah. So we just explain how you make the shared key, but then we say we take a regular address or a regular private key. We just add a shared key to it so that nobody else in the world can see what's going on. Okay, so you, Ruben, you were going to send money to my donation address. Now we've tried to explain how that works. Mm -hmm. We've explained how that works. I hope people have been able to follow that. <laughs> yeah. So you're sending money to that address. Yeah. Now the question is, how do I know that you did that? And how do I actually, you know, generate the private key that corresponds to that? Because yeah. I, I need to know about it, right? Yeah. So the first thing you need is you need to know the key that I used in order to generate the shared secrets. Because you're, you know your key, obviously, and I know your key because it was publicly online on your Twitter profile or whatever. Um, and so the key that I use is one of the keys of the inputs in the transaction that I create. So if I want to send a payment to you, I create a transaction. The transaction has inputs. The inputs uh, have a public key corresponding to them, and I know the private key of those uh, those keys. And this is just a Bitcoin private key, public key, just a, yes. just a public key that you were using anyways, that, that exactly. has your money on it, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when I create that transaction, I pick my input, and that is the key that I use to generate the new address that only you can spend, and that is where I sent the money. And so the second step, so this is this is how I make the payment. But the second step is for you to recognize that I actually did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is sort of the uh, tricky part and sort of the downside, I would say, of this proposal, which is that in order for you to recognize that I made a payment, you have to go and check every transaction that appears on the Bitcoin blockchain. And you have to go and see if it is a payment to you. And the way you do that is basically the same way we generated this address. You are also going to generate the address and you're going to see so you're going to take the inputs, you're going to generate the shared secrets, uh, add it to your own key, see if the result is one of the outputs. And that is how you recognize whether or not you got paid. So it's a lot of effort, um, but the effort is all sort of on, the, on the recipient side. And if you're running a full node already, it's relatively not a lot more effort. So, so basically every input of every transaction on the blockchain could be, as a recipient, could be for you. So yeah. So that means you have to inspect every single transaction that's on the blockchain. Yeah. And for every input of every transaction, you want to add your shared key to it. And then that generates an address. And you then see, hey, is this transaction actually spending to that address? If so, boom, you just essentially add that address to your own wallet. And then it just functions as any other um, wallet address well, would function. Well, I guess I mean, it's already the case that Every, you need to check every transaction to see if there's an output for you, right? So, yes. so the new part, yes. the new part is that you have to do some extra calculations to yeah. see if the inputs and then. But it's definitely combine. a lot of extra work, right? So regularly, yeah. normally, what you do is when you see a transaction, you only care about the outputs. I mean, you care whether the transaction is valid at all. That's why you look at the inputs. But 
the outputs, the only thing you, your wallet needs to do is look at the script pub key of this output. So basically the destination of the output and then compare it to the list of addresses or script pub keys in your own wallet. So that is just comparing one list to another list. That's very cheap. But in this new scheme, you need to do uh, basically uh, elliptic curve key multiplication yeah. on every input. And then that gives you an address. So it is significantly more work than just looking at a list. Yeah, and, and to give a sort of a, a, a sort of approximate uh, idea of like how much work that is, it is as if you uh, check every signature twice instead of once. Uh, that is uh, sort of a very rough uh, way of saying it. Yeah, well, so it definitely increases the time you need to verify blocks. But yeah, if you look at that uh, from the perspective of your node is running, you know it's already synced and it's just running, then one block comes in every 10 minutes, your node will verify that block in a few seconds. So maybe it'll take half a second longer. That's fine. The, the bigger barrier is when you first want to sync the whole node. If you, yeah. you want to restore from a backup, things get a little bit more hairy. Yeah. But I think we can get into that later. Yo, what is going on, guys? We are proud to have Voltage as a sponsor of this episode. How many of you developers out there have wanted a streamlined infrastructure provider for your particular project? Well, I'll tell you what, Voltage is the Bitcoin infrastructure provider you have been looking for that makes building on Bitcoin quick and easy, whether it's Bitcoin nodes, Lightning nodes, BTC pay, and so much more. But don't take it from me. Just ask the guys over at Amboss, Sphinx, Podcast Index, and Thunder Games, and so many others that you guys already know and love. Their enterprise-grade products make it fast and easy to build, deploy, and scale your next project. So make it easy on yourself. Even Normie plebs can use the dashboard or API. Don't wait before the next block confirmation. Let your team focus on building great products and let Voltage handle all the rest. Voltage is your go-to zero management Bitcoin infrastructure solution. Yeah, that, that is something uh, actually I would like to get into now, uh, cool. perhaps, because so there are... Ruben is taking charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if we do it later, it's just going to be more confusing. So no, no, that's go why for it. I, uh, why it's I, called I, Bitcoin I Explained insisting. now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things you can do to make this process faster. And so as Shores was, was saying, when, once you're at the tip and you're validating and a new block comes in, you just have to validate everything. Uh, but one of the things you can do is there, there are a couple of things you can do to sort of speed it up when you um, when you resync a, a node and you have an address and you want to know if if there's any outputs that are yours. Um, so the first thing you can do is simply have a birthday on your key uh, and say, okay, well, I created this key in let's say 2022. Um, so let's say January 2022. So from January 2022. I go and I check every block. And before that, I don't even bother. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing is that this uh, protocol, uh, in principle, is going to only create taproot outputs. So any transaction that doesn't uh, have any taproot outputs in them can uh, be ignored. And so you don't have to check those transactions. Um, that is sort of a thing that saves a lot of effort right now because we don't have a lot of taproot transactions yet. But uh, you know, in, in time, eventually, everything is going to be a taproot transaction. At least that's the hope. Uh, so it's the kind of it's an optimization that helps today, but won't won't help tomorrow. Let's say. Yeah. Um, and then the biggest one is that instead of validating every transaction from the entire history, what you can actually do is you can take the UTXO set and only check those outputs and see if any of those outputs correspond to a payment that uh, that belongs to you. And uh, the downside of this is that you will have no history, so you won't be able to see uh, any outputs that w were yours and were spent, uh, but you will find all the outputs that were unspent. And uh, it also requires a bit more of a uh, sort of an additional database that ties the uh, inputs that you might require to do this calculation to the uh, UTXO and the UTXO set. So there's there's a bit more complexity there, but but the the benefit there is that basically instead of scanning the entire history, you can now just take the UTXO set, scan that, and find every unspent output that belongs to you. Right, yeah. And, and then you'd need to somehow get the inputs that relate that ref refers to the yes output yeah okay yeah. yeah so so when you look at how a node is actually built and you know bitcoin core is built in one way but maybe lib bitcoin is built in a very different way mm -hmm. um there are certain pieces of information that are very easy to access and certain pieces of information that are 
a little bit more work to access, and that can really matter with a proposal like this. Yeah. Because if the information, for example, is sitting in your RAM memory, that's very quick to access. If, on the other hand, you need to go on a disk, it's very slow to access. Um, and you may have a pruned node. A pruned node throws away all blocks. So if you need any information that is in an old block, then things get really, really, really slow because yeah. either you just can't get the information or you'd have to download the block again and then get it. So those details matter. And uh, one of the things that I think need to be done and you're working on it or you're having other people work on it or you're hoping other people work on it. <laughs> there is there is a is, pseudonym. Is benchmarking. Yeah. Yeah, and this benchmarking basically could do things like, okay, we could, you know, change the proposal and do a little bit more signature verifications, or we could change the proposal in some other way, which means we need to do more disk reading. And now let's try on the Raspberry Pi, you know, with the real blockchain, what performs better, what performs worse. Yeah, uh, that sort of stuff. Is this a good time to get into the comparison with the earlier proposals? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So. Yeah. How does this compare to earlier proposals? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, so the, the original stealth address proposal uh, mm -hmm. by uh, Peter Todd, that one um, basically ha is quite similar. But the, the thing that was different is that because the, the sort of the scanning requirement was seen as something that was too, uh, too much effort. So instead of taking the key from the input, uh, the idea was that when you generate a payment, you add an op return to it. And in the op return, you add a key. And then that is the key that is being used. And the downside of this- Yeah, so in that yeah. case, the, 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 the sender's key, it, in your proposal, the sender's key is actually just the Bitcoin key, the, the one you're using to send money from. Yeah. In this earlier proposal by Peter Todd, there's sort of a special key that that's yeah. not the same key as the one that's used to spend money from, yeah. right? And that's included in a, up return a Correct. bit of extra data yeah. in the transaction yeah <clears throat> yeah and so when you do that uh, obviously you you add more um overhead because now you have an op return um and the the upside from the recipient side well it's sort of a half upside because one of the upsides is you still have to scan every transaction but now you only have to scan every transaction with an op return attached to it and um, you only have to look at that op return. Yes, it's it's a lot less math than you need to do uh, in your proposal. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and and the database lookups and stuff are are easier too because you don't have to kind of go back and find the input. Uh, it's it's right there in one of the outputs. Um, so it, it's sort of an in between solution that never really um, got popular, and I think even the the BIP itself was never finished. Um, and I, I, I yeah yeah I guess one of the downsides is. It makes transactions bigger because now you got to include yeah. an up return. So, you know, box fill up faster if a lot of people do that and fees go up. Yeah. There's also uh, a privacy and, downside. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of an indicator that it might be a stealth payment, yes, right? Very I mean, even though you, you're not sure, but if it's an indecipherable up return, then that yeah. seems kind of likely. Yeah. Well, it, it also means that other people looking at the blockchain can see how many friends you have. Well, friends, quote unquote. So, because the number of up returns to your stealth address that's publicly known, you know, people can take, can just count them or is uh, it not, that's, not, 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 that's only with BIP 47. Then. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're confusing the two now. Yeah. Okay. No, no. So that, that's not quite true. Um, it is sort of a general, you, you see a bunch of transactions without returns and those are all stealth payments, but you don't know who those payments are going to. And uh, the recipients have to check all those specific addresses. So it's sort of an in-between solution where you, you could say like, it's sort of like my proposal, but instead there's a tag that says, okay, oh, this is a stealth payment, right? And, well, and this might and be a data. stealth payment. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, I think it's quite obvious, unfortunately. So, oh, okay. So the yeah. opportune is only indicating that it's a stealth payment. And then after the opportune is the shared key? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, you could probably do that with just combining signatures and then you're pretty much back to your proposal, right? Uh, if you- Instead of using up return, you would yeah. just basically use some sort of added, uh, I don't know, added key or tweaked key and you just have to check every key. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of similarity. And I, I think the, uh, the stealth adders proposal also had uh, the suggestion of adding sort of yet another identifier of saying like, okay, well, instead of checking every up return, we we mark it where let's say you know you pick a number between let's say zero and uh, and uh, sixty four or something, and so my 
stealth payment is let's say 64 exactly so whenever in the upper turn it says number 64 and then there's a public key i only check those so it reduces the anonymity set even further uh, but it also lowers the scanning requirements yeah right. exactly your proposal is, has, is a lot of work but yeah. uh, a stealth transaction will look exactly the same as any yeah. other transaction yeah okay and then there's what is it, BIP 47? That is correct, yeah. And, and that uses the concept of a handshake, I would say. So you, you publish your stealth address or whatever it is. Uh, I think they use a pain name as a term or that some it, people. That is a term that Samurai Wallet uses. Um, and I think Sparrow Wallet has it implemented as well. But uh, that mm-hmm. is, you know, that's just the implementation. In, in principle, it's BIP 47. Yeah, so, so you publish this essentially public key. And then uh, when you want to send somebody money using that, you do an announcement transaction first. So you send somebody a simple, you, you send around a simple, I think you send a op return payment to that address yeah. or something like that. That's correct. And that all that op return address and that op return then includes some sort of key uh, that the recipient now knows, okay, I now have a new friend and I need to start monitoring the following addresses. So in this case, from one single transaction, you as the recipient can now generate a whole set of addresses that you just monitor as if you got an XPUB. Yeah. Right. And so that's nice. The downside is, in this case, what I said before, incorrectly for the other one, is now everybody can see how many friends you have. Yeah. Because at this handshake address is going to be a bunch of op return transactions to that address. So you can count, you know, a, a maximum of the number of friends you have. I guess somebody could pretend that they're like five people. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and it, so if it adds a little bit of blow to the blockchain. But, yeah, but well, so that seems to be the biggest trade-off. Is, is that right? So the, your proposal, Ruben, mm-hmm. doesn't add any extra data to the blockchain. And then the trade-off is that the recipient has to do quite a bit of work because it has to check all the transactions. While yeah. the other proposals in their own ways, they add more data to the blockchain, but then it is easier after you've done that. And then there's more nuances, but is this? Yeah, yeah. well, with these stealth addresses, there's still a lot of work to do. So I think the stealth addresses are sort of just old and, and outdated. And I think you can just sort of leave those aside. But for BIP47 specifically, um, yes, there is not the scanning requirement. So, so what you said is correct uh, for BIP47. But uh, to add a little bit to the downsides, um, so it is also, in you know, when you create this notification transaction, you're also spending one of your outputs to create that notification. And then those outputs that you're using uh, can then not be used for regular payments if you want to stay anonymous. So it's sort of like you you have to sort of, the, the, the money that you use to create the notifications need to be kept completely separate from the money that you use uh, to pay people. And that is in general, very difficult for uh, wallets to implement. And a lot of wallets haven't implemented this correctly. Uh, and so there's a lot of potential there for sort of privacy leaking, unfortunately. Right. So you think you have a stealth address, you think you're sending anonymously, but actually because of that announcement, somebody else can just still see exactly if, both from the sender side, they can just see that the sender was doing this, but also yeah. it means the recipient loses anonymity because if the sender screw up, yeah, there is. You can tell the recipient received this many coins because of this uh, this correlation. Yeah, so that's a risk. Uh, but uh, one thing that's maybe interesting to note is that in Prague, uh, I had a discussion with uh, a couple of other developers, uh, namely uh, Martin and uh, Alekos, um, and we have sort of thought of an idea to sort of ba- make Bit Forty Seven better and make make it so that the notification transaction can be outsourced to someone else. So there's maybe a way to sort of mitigate that for BIP47. Hmm. And, and then the only downside that you are left with is the uh, the fact that it uses additional on-chain space. Um, and other than that, uh, it sort of functions. So that would uh, that would sort of make the comparison a little bit more favorable uh, in in in, uh, in term uh, in terms of uh, comparing into uh, bi- uh, comparing silent payments with BIP forty seven, mm-hmm. uh, but still there is sort of this uh, this difference in uh, on chain space usage, which is particularly uh, problematic for single payments when you want to send a one time donation to someone, then you know that overhead of that notification is is quite significant. Uh, might be useful also to compare to some other generic schemes to solve the same problem. Hmm. So one is that instead of publishing, well, one is that it requires a little bit of interaction. Somebody has to send you an email anonymously hmm. uh, and you reply with an XPUB and now they can just send, you know, whatever they want to that XPUB. Yeah. Um, that's one thing you can do. <clears throat> uh, you could run a little Tor hidden service that will just hand out XPUBs to anybody who asks. That is a 
problem with uh, you know denial of service and of course you have to run the server yeah. denial of service means basically somebody could ask you for an xpub and then ask you for an xpub and ask you for an xpub and then for every time you've given out an xpub you've got to monitor like a thousand addresses yeah. forever yeah so that's one thing another obvious thing you can do is use lightning because with lightning yeah. you have a public key <clears throat> and something like a bolt 12 tattoo once that's finalized uh, will make it just very easy to receive money, but it means some. The, that puts a bit more burden on the sender. Definitely not as much burden on the recipient because what you're proposing doesn't sound more difficult than running a lightning node. Yeah, uh, yeah. at least not more resource intense than running a lightning node. Yeah, but um, uh, but but for the sender, of course, they have to run a lightning node. Yeah, it's it's interactive essentially. When yeah, you do use lightning. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but Ruben just promoted to the base chain, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, now we're moving back uh, to Lightning. Don't, don't, base... don't kick him back to Lightning. <laughs> no. let, him, let him enjoy stay here. And and on the base chain, you can run a PTC pay server or yeah. something like that. That'll yeah. give out a unique address every time. That's a little bit less of a DDoS problem uh, than an XPubs. Uh, I mean, you still have to give out a new address, right, for BTC pay server. I still think it's a problem. I wonder how they solve that problem, actually, because you have the same issue where if you continually ask for addresses... Yeah, a, but an XPUB, yeah. you know, represents a thousand addresses, so your I, problem is, is guess so. a thousand times bigger, but it's the same type yeah, of problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. And so uh, just to sort of generalize, I think the sort of the trade-offs that you're, uh, you're mentioning here is one of interactivity, where with silent payments, the nice thing is it is just entirely non-interactive, uh, but you are absolutely correct that, you know, given sort of like the, the complexity of, of what you said, uh, it is possible to solve this with interaction. And and that is, you know, essentially kind of what we started off with, with me saying, okay, well, if Aaron just gives me a new address every time I want to send a payment to him, uh, that works too. Right, cool. yeah. The, the, the whole point is to make this non-interactive. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to mention one cool possibility that I saw somebody bring up on one of the threads um, that related to this, which is the idea of using DNS or the dot well-known URL um, to announce mm. your address. So what you can do is if you run a web server or React, you know, you have a provider that does that for you, is you could say, well, if somebody types in my email address, then uh, the wallet will just basically know where to look, either in the DNS record or at a specific spot on yeah. the web server, and it will get the uh, key there. Yeah. So then uh, if you have a very smart wallet, I could imagine that I just type somebody's email address and it'll see, oh, is there a... Um, is there a silent payment ID there? Is there a Bolt 12 invoice there? Is there an LN URL thing there? I'll just pick one of those three and I'm going to send the money to it. Yeah. So from a user, from a usage point of view, it's very nice to have these static identifiers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. That's uh, that's interesting. And and I also have a downside, but that might be solvable. <laughs> and that is what I would call the Hotel California problem. Okay. Because basically, once you've given out this thing. Mm. people can keep paying it to it forever. And at yeah. some point you might realize, ah, this, this running this extra thing on my node is pretty heavy. I, I'd like to, you know, downgrade. I'd like to stop using yeah. this. Yeah. And I think that can be solved by just putting an expiration date into them. Like saying like, okay, they, yeah. don't send coins to me after this block height. Mm. Uh, that would just be part of the standard. Mm. And then you scan a few hundred thousand, or you scan like 10,000 blocks extra just to be sure. But uh, but you definitely want to make sure that people can opt out of this stuff. Yeah, because with Bolt Twelve, that's not a problem, right? With Lightning, you still have to ask an invoice, and if the mm. server doesn't respond, you don't send money to it. But with this, yeah, if somebody sends you money fifty years from now, yeah, like your descendants will have to like scan the whole blockchain. Yeah, um, that that is a good point, and uh, something I hadn't really thought about. Uh, but I agree that it would be nice to support maybe a uh, a date at which uh, you stop. Uh, well, either you stop using the address or you have to refresh the address as to say like, okay, well yeah. now I'm going to accept it for longer. So that's when, when you combine it with this DNS uh, server system, yeah. you would, your wallet would just ask again and you could have very short expiration dates even on them. Yeah. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, but you could, you could use the same payment code again. Yeah. You could just say like, okay, I'm only going to guarantee this thing for like a week. Uh, and then if you ask again next week, I'll say, okay, no, don't worry. You can use the same key. It's yeah. going to be valid for another week. Yeah. Something like that. That's. Yeah, I mean, I have a whole bunch of like implementation stuff, but I don't think we have to get there. <laughs> That's interesting, though. But so. yeah. How long have we been recording? Just 
uh, 33 uh, minutes. How deep are we into this stuff? I because think there's there's a lot more in the show notes, or at least there's yeah. some more in the show notes. Sure. Like, do we want to get into that? Nah, I've covered everything I wanted to cover, but... Yeah, I guess uh, the, the one the, thing... There's this... F- yeah. We'll go on, Ruben. Yeah, uh, just one thing I, w- I wanted to mention maybe is that... Uh, I think the what what's good to point out here is that the the scanning downside really is mainly a downside if you're not running a full node. Uh, if you're running a full node, you know the way I look at it is that well we still have to kind of get these benchmarks. Uh, and so as uh, as Shores already mentioned, there's a there's a pseudonym called the W0XLT, who I'm uh, you know trying to uh, sort of collaborate with a little bit now. Uh, in order to uh, sort of get these benchmarks, and, and he's already created an implementation. And once we have those, we can get a better idea. But like my my feeling is that we can get it down to a level where, if you're running a full node and you're at you're doing this additional computation to receive these these silent payments, uh, it is not a lot of extra overhead. Um, so from that perspective, I think you could say that sort of the overhead is practically zero if you're already running a full node. And then for light clients, the problem is that even the, the like many of the light clients, most of the light clients we have today, they have uh, they share an XPub with whatever server is running the light client for them. And if you give out your XPub to a server, you lose all your privacy. So it's actually very difficult to have a light client and have privacy at the same time. It's not impossible. We have uh, BIP 157 and 158 uh, that is uh, compact block filters. So you could have sort of a light client that uh, preserves your priv- privacy better. But as far as I know, it's maybe Wasabi wallets, and I'm not even sure some Lightning wallets maybe use it. But other than that, most wallets don't really do that today. Um, so my argument there is sort of that if you care about privacy, you already sort of have to run a full node. And how, so you mentioned there's a pseudonym working on this. So yeah. how how concrete is this? Are we gonna? When am I gonna be able to use this? Or well, I did run the demo today on Signet. Cool. Talk about it. So that was fun. Uh, yeah. So so the pseudonym you talked about. Uh, let's call him Ox. Ox. Yeah, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, created a pull request on Bitcoin Core that is like really marked as like this is just a proof of concept. Yeah. Don't don't merge this. Don't even use this with real coins, right? Yeah. Um, and it allows you to create a wallet that can receive silent payments, and it allows you to use any wallet really to send silent payments. Yeah. And you know it requires a little bit of manual stuff, and uh, but it worked. I mean, at least it seemed to work. I haven't checked if the math actually worked. If somebody steals my Signet coins, <laughs> I, I don't care for real coins. Sure. I want to be a little bit more sure that this is right. I have some remarks in mind that I'll probably post before the show comes out. But excellent. I mean, if you look, I mean, there are different approaches to get a new proposal like this done, right? Yeah. So, and I would congratulate you. I think this is. The first time or the fastest ever that you've gone from like proposing something really complicated <laughs> to something that actually demos the concept. And, True. and I personally, I like running code yeah. to understand something better. And so, and then when I looked at it, like this approach of changing Bitcoin Core to support it is one approach. Another yeah. approach could be something like what Spectre Wallet does is you create a tool that people download or install that is separate from Bitcoin Core, but that uses Bitcoin Core yeah. wherever it's useful. And so I looked at both possibilities and it's both are not trivial in this case. Yeah. Um, for details, I don't think we necessarily have to go into, but Agreed. it. But this proposal, I don't think this pull request will ever, well, will not get merged in the short run. Yeah. Uh, even if he improves everything. Not in Bitcoin Core. No. And the couple of reasons for that is because it essentially requires another index, um, which takes up space and it, it is, you know, like you said, it's maybe not the worst extra performance downside, but it's still pretty significant. You know, it still adds. So I think Bitcoin Core would not very quickly commit to a feature that yeah. it has to maintain forever that yeah. really eats a lot of resources and may screw with other proposals that might enhance scaling. Like how does this combine with Assume UTXO or how does this combine with U3XO or... Yeah. Um, so... So that's why I think it's better to go for a separate tool. On the yeah. other hand, any demo that works, I'm happy with it. I don't yeah. really care how it's done, whether whether the, the demo is a modified version of Bitcoin Core or or a little Python script. I don't think it matters as long as people play with the demo because standards will get much better when people actually try them. Uh, otherwise, you get things like BIP32 and like, oh, gap limits. Yeah, I guess we should have thought about that. 
yeah, uh, yeah. before we defined a standard. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm happy to see that. I yep. just I just would want to caution the listener. This is probably going to take a while. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And uh, yeah. because I, I I guess I should explain the other side of it. If you make a separate tool. Now you're no longer a first class citizen of Bitcoin Core. So you have to communicate through Bitcoin Core through the RPC and it has very limited features, very limited yeah. things you can do. And one of the things you may want to do is very tightly integrate with block validation. So mm. when a block comes in, you want to do some processing specifically for the wallet. You can't do that right now with, with Bitcoin RPC. So yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah, there there's some uh, some complexity there. But uh, yeah, at, high, at a high level I, I agree with you. And uh, so one of the things that's sort of uh tricky for me is that actually uh, um Space Chains is sort of the project that I'm currently focused on. And now this this silent payment thing it, it was supposed to be sort of a side project where I thought like, okay, I'm just going to put this out on a you know, on a gist and then I'm done with it and then you know, people start running with it and uh, and uh, this Ox guy, he implements it and now I'm like, okay, shit, I got to yeah, I'll put some uh, some effort into this as well now. So I'm, I'm being pulled into multiple directions, but it's a good thing because it's it's a success story, I guess. Yeah, I so. mean, Space Chains is literally a side project, right? <laughs> it's, it's a side chain project, yes. <laughs> that's, that's the pun good of joke, the week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a good pun. I I have another pun on the GitHub comment, but it's not for here. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to hearing that uh, off, offline uh, then. I cannot wait, yours to read that. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> okay, I think that covers everything. Yeah, is there, I mean, there's is there many anything, other things. Uh, Aaron, I think there's something you wanted to bring up still, or am I mistaken here? I mean, I was going to ask about CoinJoin. Ah, oh, yes, of course. That seems yeah. like it's opening up another can of worms. I don't know if we want to go that, there. That is true. I, if, I now, now that I've brought it up, we can't really <laughs> that is, that is also true, yeah. ignore it now, completely. I, Do you want to summarize yeah. this in like a minute? I think we should briefly look at the worms. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Now, that's actually a good one to, to point out. So I, I think this is one of these things that I, I feel most uncomfortable with in terms of uh, how, like, because what you ideally what you want to do is you want this protocol to not get in, in the way of how people do transactions. And so far, the way we've described it, it sort of works really well if there is one sender, if I create the transaction. But what if we wanted to create a transaction as a coin join where we have multiple people adding their inputs. Um, and so so the first issue is that you sort of have two variants of- uh, And then one of the recipients is a stealth address. Uh, yeah, exactly, yes. Yes, that's good, good to add, yeah, thank you. Um, so the first issue is sort of that you have you have two variants that you could, could do for uh, silent payments. Well, there are more variants, but these are the two sort of main ones, which is either you pick one, one input and you use that to generate the shared secrets, or you pick the combination of all the inputs. And this is particularly relevant with coin joins because if you pick just one input, then what that means is that if someone pays you in a coin join, then the recipient normally doesn't know what your input was. So that's actually very good for privacy. But if you use the silent payments, now if, you, if it's just with a single input, you can see which input was paying you. And so that leaks uh, some privacy for the sender. Yeah, you can see which input pays you because that's the one that adds up to your new address. Exactly. There's only one input that matches your new address. Yeah. Yes. And so that's solvable by saying, okay, well, we pick all the inputs instead uh, and we add those inputs together and we use that to generate the shared secret. But once you do that, you need the collaboration of all the coin joint participants. And in fact, you need them to generate a shared secret. And you also don't want them to know who you are paying. So you need to get them to give you their shared secret in a way that they don't know what they're giving to you. And there's there's a protocol for that too, which is basically a blind way of doing a Diffie-Hellman, uh, which is also uh, used in eCash. Um, long story short, a lot of complexity. A lot of worms. Yeah, and you're actually making the single, the, the simple case, you're making that more complicated by aggregating the signatures because normally when I use a wallet to make this silent payment, mm -hmm. I just need to pick one coin, one input, and then if I if the wallet needs to, it can just add more inputs to that transaction and it will still work. Yeah. But if you want to have all the inputs count towards the shared key, then I need to decide before I have the set destination address, I need to decide which coins I'm going to use. Yeah. And so then you have the coin selection process separate from the uh, payment process. And that at least in Bitcoin Core, that's going to give you another can of worms that I recommend not opening. Yeah. There are solutions to it. 
But. Yeah, well, well, the the other thing that's sort of nice about adding all the input keys together and why I sort of gravitate towards that is that it essentially cuts down the scanning requirement in half because now instead of having to scan every individual input, you can scan the aggregation of all, all the inputs. And on average, a transaction has two inputs. That's true, but that's where the benchmarking has to come in because yes. I would not be surprised at all if the whether you look at inputs individually or you add them up, most of the work is probably going to be in fetching the original transactions from some disk somewhere. And then the actual elliptic curve math is going to be much less than that. Because in general, it takes a long time to read something from a disk. It takes yeah. a very short time to do a calculation on the CPU. Yeah. But that could be completely wrong. That's why you want to benchmark this yeah. stuff. I, I, uh, so I... I am sort of, I have the same concern in terms of this needs to be benchmarked and we need to compare it all. And quite frankly, I, I even think that maybe the UTXO set scanning is overkill too. And maybe it's just better to just do the, the entire scanning when you do IBD and maybe that's uh, sufficient. Um, so it's sort of, uh, yeah, it, it all comes down to the benchmarks basically. I agree with that. Cool. Okay. I think that's, uh, that's our episode. George, what do you yep. think? Sounds good. I'm not going to put this thing as a tattoo on me yet, oh. um, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it in mind. Um, yep, I think that's it. So thank you for listening to Bitcoin. Explained. <laughs>